So Dr. Vijay Nambi is a professor from Baylor, and uh, he is a very active clinician and also a clinical researcher. Uh, we've worked together on a, a few projects. I can tell you that he's uh, very, very astute when it comes to taking care of people with heart disease and also in uh, doing research in, in cardiovascular disease. He's going to talk to us now about um, risk factors uh, for heart disease. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. All right, as I get my slides up there, again, nice to meet all of you, and thank you to Methodist for putting up this uh, very important discussion that we should be having, or we should have had a long time ago, but at least it's coming to the fore right now. So I was given the charge of talking about a woman at risk. How does she prevent a heart attack? So in that part of it is the knowledge of what causes a heart attack, and Dr. Cook has you know, introduced us to that concept really nicely right now. And I'm going to build on that, looking at what risk factors are, how early these things appear, and what we should do about it, and give a framework for, so that our further speakers can build on uh, the treatment of it and the differences itself. Now, um, Dr. Cook mentioned that uh, coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of death in women in the United States in the whole Western world for that matter. In fact, there are more women who have strokes than men do. And this is the average number that was quoted in the American Heart Association statistics thing. Why is that? Probably women live longer than men, so you have a little bit more time to be able to get the stroke. But the point is, cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death in women and in men in the United States. So the thing is normally, uh, because men tend to have a higher risk for heart disease in general, people always think that, oh, being a woman, less likely to have heart disease. But it's still the leading killer. So if we don't have the awareness of it and we don't take charge of it, then that's a lo you know, losing cause right up front because knowledge at the first part is the power for you to move forward with that. So, what is the antecedent or what causes cardiovascular disease? As Dr. Cook pointed out, atherosclerosis is the hallmark or the basis by which you know, cholesterol buildup happens in your plaque, in your arteries, and that leads to these cardiovascular disease. Not every plaque is going to rupture. Not everybody with atherosclerosis is going to have a heart attack. Okay? In fact, I call atherosclerosis a lifetime achievement award. If you live long enough, all of us will get it. Okay, and I can assure you that most of us here already have some amount of atherosclerosis going on. Okay, so the thing is, it's not something, it's not our goal to try to defeat atherosclerosis. It's very difficult by itself, but the point is to try to prevent its complications, which are heart attack and stroke, which is what leaves us with morbidity and mortality. In other words, you know, leave, leave us with uh, problems with that. So Dr. Cook pointed out what these risk factors were. Okay, age, can't do much about that. Okay, gender, can't do much about that. Well, at least it's you know, bad for men <laughs> compared to women, and for the most part, we can't do much about that. Then you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, and physical inactivity. Now remember, physical inactivity feeds into a lot of the other things. Physical inactivity leads to diabetes, leads to high blood pressure, leads to higher cholesterol, and in turn, all of these cause you know, atherogenesis or the process of plaque buildup, which in turn leads to what we were talking about, the cardiovascular disease itself. Now, if you look at the US population, this was 2003, so quite some time ago. What you notice is, look at the number of risk factors. Okay, um, let me just get this working real quick. There you go. Look at the number of risk factors and the prevalence of it. Prevalence means how many people have it, okay? The most common risk factor is physical inactivity. This is something that each one of us can do something about because this is completely in our control. But that tends to be the most common you know, risk factor, if you would, which leads to obesity. So both of these are the most common risk factors. And as you can see, the other things, cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, and diabetes are also prevalent at a pretty high rate, but relative to the physical inactivity is lesser. Now, what's more interesting is these were people who came with a heart attack or the first manifestation of it. The scariest part on this is, you know, a good majority of them had no traditional risk factors. In other words, your heart attack could be your first manifestation of your atherosclerosis. That's not to say that these, you know, not, another way to look at it is maybe these people had zero risk factors when they came in because they never saw a doctor, did not know what their risk was. So this is where prevention becomes a important cornerstone of treatment and preventing heart attacks. Now, if you went to a doctor and you said, I felt perfectly fine, 
and he or she told you, well, you know, because of this, your blood pressure is marginally high, your cholesterol is a little bit this way, this is that, so I'm going to prescribe you one medication, two, three. These medications may cause these side effects, can give you muscle pain, can cause you maybe to lose your memory a little bit, can maybe do all of this. How many of you are sold on that idea? Right? So prevention is the toughest thing because I have to convince somebody who's feeling absolutely well that I'm trying to institute some medications which may or may not prevent a heart attack or a stroke 10 years down the line. So this is the challenge in prevention when you're trying to tell somebody who's feeling well that these are things that could potentially help you. And therein lies our assessment of risk and benefits as we go forward. So knowing your risk, in other words, if you are at a higher risk, you'd be willing to take that risk. Okay. The, the analogy I use when I see my patients in clinic is, you know, there's always a risk in every, anything we do. When we walk on the road, you could get hit by a car. This could happen in the surface street next to your home or if you cross a freeway. But we never cross a freeway because we know that's kind of, you know, stupid. On the other hand, we always do cross, you know, a surface street next to our home. And we think of it in our mind, we look around and we cross. Okay. So maybe it's a surface street next to our home, we're looking at our phone and crossing. But on the other hand, if you're crossing fan in a hole come, you won't do that. Because we play this risk and benefit in our mind all the time, okay? Medicine is partly that too. There is no free lunch, there's no intervention or medication without a risk, okay? But the, quest, the point is, when do we recommend that? We recommend that when we feel the benefit outweighs the risk. But the problem is, science is not in a state where I can tell an individual person is the benefit going to outweigh the risk in you. So I have to base my information on a general population, and I say overall, the benefit might, seems to be more than the risk. So perhaps I would recommend this based on all what I know. Okay? It, you may have a side effect, but if you have a side effect, you can always back off at that point in time. The question is, do you want to try it, or what the side effect is, and will you be willing to take that risk? And that's the conversation that a physician and a patient should always have to try to promote prevention and promote health. So, Based on this, the, the identification that cardiovascular disease still was the number one killer in, in the United States, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology came up with these metrics for what they consider to be ideal health. So in here, you look at this, no smoking or quit greater than 12 months ago, a body mass index less than 25, a total cholesterol less than 200 without medications, a blood pressure of 120 on the higher number, what we call the systolic, and less than 80 on the lower number without medications, a fasting blood glucose of less than 100, activity, about 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week, or about 150 minutes per week of moderate activity, and a diet which is a balanced diet including fruits, vegetables, fish, whole grains, sodium less than 1500, and less than 36 ounces or three, four cups of sweetened drinks a week. This is what they said was a, you know, a good ideal health metric that we all should aspire for. Okay, so based on this, they also came up with what they call the simple seven, and these are tools which tell you what to do to get to that point. Their goal was by 2020 to have a 20% reduction in risk factors and a 20% reduction in heart attacks and things like that. It just sounded good, 2020, 2020, okay? But it's not that we want, you know, we will be able to achieve those goals, but at least to get the, you know, the, uh, the step in the right direction to be able to start proceeding towards that. This is things that are freely available on the website. If you go to American Heart Association and look for Simple 7, they'll tell you what these are. Now, I'll ask you a question. What percentage of a middle-aged U.S. population do you think meet these seven ideal health metrics? So let's take a guess here. How many people think about 10%? Okay. How many people think about 1%? How many people think about 25%? Okay. So here was the study, ADIC study, which we've been involved in. This is a middle-aged population. Okay. Now here is the slide that tells you what that was. You see there on the top there, the number of people who met all seven metrics, 0.1%. <laughs> okay, 0.1%. Okay, now the stunning thing is, zero metrics, all, none of the seven who were met were 2.5%. And in fact, you, you might say, okay, if you look through the list, all of us probably fell off in one thing or something else, okay? Then you say, six, even that was 2.8%. So it's an alarmingly low number of people who did that. If you thought that was men alone, look at the women on the other side there, okay? They're better than men, like in most things, but <laughs> as far as the metrics go, still not quite there, right? So the point being, these are ideal health metrics that were proposed by the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, which so few of a middle-aged population who are at risk for heart disease meet at this point of time. 
So therein lies our challenge. You know, you have a good discussion in the evening going forward as to what we should take out of this and what we should do. If we can start improving these metrics, we will be helping the American Heart Association in turn, the population at large, going towards a healthier heart. Now, since then, they've come up with a new risk tool where what they've done is they've actually tightened what would be optimal values. You know, the cholesterol went from less than 200 to less than 170. Your HDL cholesterol is 50. Your systolic blood pressure is less than 110. Okay, obviously the other things, no smoking, no, you know, uh, diabetes and all of that. So you can imagine what percentage of population are going to meet that, right? If it's 0.1% who met all the other things, this is a little bit more stricter, so there's going to be a fewer people who would meet that. So I don't think it would surprise you to tell you that atherosclerosis starts when we are kids, okay? The process, the, the slides that Dr. Cook showed about how the plaque, you know, the, the, the blisters that form and things like that, they looked at two to 15 year old, and 50% of them started having streaks, the fatty streaks developing, okay? And if you look at in the heart artery itself, by 25 to 29, about 70% of people started having it. There were more men and less women who had it, but women were not too far behind, you know, 80, 85% of men and maybe 50 to 60% of women. The point being, atherosclerosis is something that goes on through your lifetime. The choices we start making as kids and everything else, this kind of translates all the way till it finally manifests as your heart attack and stroke. So prevention of atherosclerosis starts when we are kids, from the diet we eat to the activity we do and things like that. It's not to say that we can prevent all of this, but the thing is to keep it under control and at least retard its progression or slow its progression, right? So that's the whole goal of the game as far as, you know, atherosclerosis itself goes. So how should one go about preventing cardiovascular disease? The first question you ask yourself is what is your risk? Now there are several risk tools that are available. The Framingham risk score used to be the popular one that people use. Now they use something called the pooled cohort risk equation. Okay. What does it mean? They used uh, uh, four or five what we call epidemiological studies where they had data about people being followed for years and years, and they used them to come up with scores based on which you can estimate your risk. So the first thing is you, know, you want to estimate your risk. Now this risk score is meant to predict heart attack and stroke. We don't even get into heart failure, which is going to be the leading cardiovascular disease in another 15, 20 years. So this doesn't even go there, and so a lot of our research is now focused on trying to incorporate this to try to get a better risk tool or a prediction tool. But this pool cohort risk equation will get you at least your cardiovascular disease, which includes stroke risk and a heart attack risk as far as that goes. What are the parameters? It's the same table where we saw, where you enter information about your uh, gender, your age, and then your race, and then your cholesterol value, your blood pressure value, whether you're being treated for it, your diabetes, and stroke. Now what it does is it gives you two risks. Okay. The first thing is it gives you your 10-year risk, and then it gives you your lifetime risk. Okay. Now, this is my own risk score, and what you see here is a 10-year risk for somebody who had optimal risk metrics would be here at my age would have been this, you know, whatever, 1% or so, and mine was slightly higher than that. So this is the risk score as far as that was estimated. But what it also does is it projects your lifetime risk. Okay. In other words, if you didn't do anything, because, you know, I see most of you here are young. Okay, so your risk of having a heart attack in the next 10 years is going to be small. But is 10 years your lifetime? That's the question you have to answer for yourself. You know, we don't anticipate only living 10 more years. We, you know, want to live into our 80s and whatever, you know, thing. So you want to be able to also project your lifetime risk because that's another important thing to consider. And that's that concept of lifetime risk which also this risk score gives you. Now, this is not, you know, 100% perfect. If it tells you it's 30%, it doesn't mean, you know, that's what it is. But it's an approximation or a guesstimation for you to get started to at least understand what your risk is going to be. So what is considered a high lifetime risk? People have thrown numbers. This is not without any major science, but people say maybe above 40% lifetime risk is something that you know you want to do something about okay so these are things that your tool will give you when you punch these numbers in and it'll tell you if you had everything optimal what your lifetime risk would be now you can play with it you can cut out smoking you can cut out thing and you'll see how much your risk actually varies okay now although this risk score is good Okay, the one thing before that I won't go on to the other things is how does these risk scores and risk factors compare from women to men? You're gonna have some excellent speakers discuss this for you, but in general, age, the effect in women, it lags about eight to 10 years. In other words, they have a heads up over eight to 10 years. They are, you know, in, in other words, a protection for eight to 10 years as far as that goes. Smoking is less common in women, but if a woman was a smoker, they have a higher risk of heart disease compared to men. 
In other words, women smoke less often, but if they were to smoke, the risk is more than in their male counterparts. Obesity is a greater impact in postmenopausal women. Hypertension is in an elderly woman, especially for heart failure risk. Cholesterol is equally prevalent in men and women, but it's less often treated in women compared to men. Diabetes, women with type 1 diabetes have a 37% increase in mortality and two times the higher risk of uh, uh, vascular events compared to their male counterparts. These are some numbers that, you know, based on studies that have suggested how women and men compare as far as the risk factor itself goes. But the other important thing you would have noticed in your risk factor estimation when I looked at all those parameters is it doesn't consider your family history. Okay, now you know that genetics are a strong component of it. It's not that the risk tool is telling you that that's not important, it's just that that information is not available to us to be able to incorporate it into our risk prediction tools. So maybe another 10, 15 years we'll come up with a new risk tool that incorporates that family history too. But as it stands now, it does not include your family history. Now anytime there's inflammatory conditions, autoimmune conditions, you know, you have lupus, you have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, all of them increase the risk of your heart attack by themselves. Why? Because inflammation destabilizes that plaque and that's the first cause, you know, why you would have a heart attack. The way I explain a heart attack happening to a lot of my patients is this. Think about this. If I take a nail and scratch myself, what happens? I bleed. The body doesn't let me bleed out. It puts a clot to prevent me from bleeding out. Now, say the same way there's a plaque in your artery, as Dr. Cook was pointing out. Say that ruptures for some reason. Guess what the body's going to do? It's going to think of that as an injury. And what does it do? It puts a clot. The clot can take it from a 20 or a 30% blockage to 100% blockage in a flash, in an instant. That's why, how most of the heart attacks happen. And this is why having a normal stress test does not mean you cannot have a heart attack. There have been famous personalities. One that comes to my mind is Tim Russert, who was uh, you know, host of Meet the, Meet the Press and NBC. He had a normal stress test about a month from before his heart attack. It's not to say that the stress test was you know, wrongly done. It could have been, but most likely what happened is that the plaque chose to rupture a month after a stress test. So always respect your symptoms. Don't think you know, it's just a little gas, it's just a little bit thing. Your symptoms, your, you always listen to your body more than anybody else. If your body tells you I'm not feeling good, go get yourself evaluated because that's the most key thing. Now, there are other risk factors if we look over here, which talk about you know, specific things in women. You know, we don't th think about radiation. Breast cancer survivors may have radiation. That increases your risk of you know, heart disease by itself. Uh, menarche, menopause, pregnancy-associated hypertension, all of these things can be contributory to your risk uh, itself. Now, this was a recent paper in 2018, which looked at stroke risk factors unique to women. And you can see several risk factors here, including your hormonal status, also about whether we're taking hormones, also pregnancy-related exposures, which are unique to women that men don't uh, experience. So what else can you do to estimate risk? Because I was telling you that these risk tools don't capture all the risk. There are a few other tools that you could consider. One of them is what we call an intima media thickness. What this is, is this is a cartoon of your carotid artery, the big artery that goes in your neck over here. What we do is we measure the thickness of that wall. Because remember where atherosclerosis happens. It's in those walls right here, right? It's just forming right here, okay? So if you're able to measure the thickness of that wall, then it can tell us perhaps what's going on with your arteries. As it's getting thicker, is that you know, some amount of atherosclerosis going on? Okay? Not only that, they can also give you information about presence or absence of plaque, which is an important antecedent you know, to uh, having coronary heart disease events. So they looked at this, and what they found was as your walls become thicker, your survival over time is lower, suggesting that people with thicker arteries have more risk for you know, stroke and heart attacks, and they may, you know, die from those. So as a result of it, your survival is a little bit lower. We looked at this also in one of our studies, and we found that at every level of thickness, if you had an addition plaque, your outcomes were worse. And this is, you know, women over here. So at every level, if you had, you know, your thickness of your artery, if you had plaque, your outcomes seemed to be a little bit worse compared to people who did not have plaque, suggesting that the value of plaque or presence or absence of it is also important. These are simple tools that you can use to further, you know, in, you know evaluate your own heart health as far as that goes. The other tool that's available is something called a coronary calcium score. It's a CAT scan or CT scan. What they do is they look for calcium deposition in your heart arteries. Now, as a plaque matures through life, it calcifies, and that's a marker of quote-unquote plaque stability, but calcium presence suggests to you that there is some plaque buildup in your heart arteries. So that's another way to look at it. Now, one word of caution between these two tests. The ultrasound that we talked about needs somebody who knows what they're doing because you know even subtle changes in the way the angle they're measuring can make it look a lot thicker than what it is. 
It can make you the highest percentile compared to the lowest percentile. So you have to go to a lab that can be able you know, uh, to give you good measurements. Now the calcium score has a little radiation with it. Any CAT scan has a little radiation with it. It's a small amount of radiation, but it's not zero. And the other thing is, typically women, you know, even at the age of 70, 50% of them don't have calcium. So if you're looking at a 40-year-old woman, it's very highly likely that they have zero calcium. So the test may come back as zero, but it doesn't totally tell you the risk because, you know, like we talked about, the age is about eight to 10 years, you know, behind uh, uh, as far as men goes. So a calcium score may not be the best test in a younger woman. It's a good test in, you know, as we start hitting the 60s and so, it's a good test. The ultrasound of the thing can give you some additional risk tools and information on that. But again, be wary of where you get it done because you have to get it done in a proper way to be able to uh, thing. Now, in fact, most research has gone into people with normal cholesterol and trying to see what happens to their vascular beds and if they already have atherosclerosis developing. And this was Dr. Fuster's group um, uh, looked at this. And what they found was this. Even if you had a cholesterol, bad cholesterol of 50 to 60, which right now as cardiologists, we'd be like, wow, that's perfect. That's great. We've done our job. We've got their patients down. Even at those levels, even at 60 to 70, a good number of people start having plaque that's recognizable. Okay. So it's kind of you know, short-sighted to say that cholesterol is all it is. There are so many other factors that go into it. So this is where the imaging can tell you things that you can't measure, things that risk factors that we don't know about. So it can have an added value, but you don't want to do it too frequently. You, don't, you want to do it in the right patient, and you want your imaging to be able to make a difference in what you do for your patient. And when they looked at the territories, you would see that the carotids, the, the aorta, and the legs. The aorta is the big artery that takes blood from your heart to the rest of the body, and your, your leg groin arteries had more plaque buildup than the other places. We actually wrote an editorial for that, that it's time to take a selfie. In other words, imaging your arteries may be an important thing for you to understand your risk, and that because all the risk factors don't tell you all the information as far as that goes. Um, we proposed a, um, a, 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 an approach saying that Primordial prevention is preventing your risk factors from developing. And we feel that that starts with our behavior, your environment, and genes. And as parents, as people in the society, we set the environment of the home, okay, and the behavior. Genes are something that, you know, is what is, is dealt to us. We deal with the genes that we get, and we have to move on. But understanding that can be important. And as we go on, this is, again, a lifelong commitment to trying to prevent atherosclerosis developing, and that's something that we need to remember. Okay, so what do we do as far as once you have these risk factors? There are some guidelines. Right now, these guidelines, for the greater part, don't change or don't differentiate between men and women as far as how we treat them because it's based on studies. So what do we do? Cigarette smoking, that's a no-brainer. You gotta quit, absolutely, because not only does it increase your cardiovascular disease risk, it also increases cancer risk and other things. So absolutely no smoking. That's an important part of it. Physical activity, something we have completely in our control, okay? at least 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise along with some strength training is what's recommended. If you can do more, great, okay? But you don't wanna be less than this as far as this goes. This is why the pedometers, 10,000 steps a day, all of these feed into it for us to be able to do what we need to as far as that goes. Now remember, these are all things that lifestyle changes that we can do by ourselves, okay? Now, as far as the risk factor, as far as the diet itself goes, a balanced diet is what's important. There are a lot of fads about different diets and what can help and things like that. But a balanced diet is the most important thing, and the AHA comes up with these nutritional guidelines as to what to do. You want to have a diet that has less than 7% of trans fat, less than 1% of the energy, and less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol. Now, it's easy to say that, but difficult practically to calculate that. So that's where knowledge is power, because you want to know what you're eating and what an average meal like that would, con would c contain so that you can actually apportion your, you know, your diet and things as far as that goes. A diet rich in fish would be helpful. A diet all poultry is OK. You want to try to avoid meats as much as possible, especially if you're you know, uh, uh, cooking them in a certain way. You know, obviously, you can increase your risk as far as that goes. Um, fruits and vegetables are an important cornerstone of these things. So a balanced diet is going to be very important as far as you know, how that can help our risk itself goes. As far as blood pressure goes, these guidelines have even since changed. Now they want us to be less than 130 over you know, 80 even. So these are guidelines that have just recently changed. But 140 over 90 at least, there are different medications. And these are simple. The main thing is you know what your blood pressure is, record them, take them to your provider so that they can have you, you know, take one medication or the other. As far as cholesterol goes, it depends on your, on your risk. Once you estimate your risk, if your bad cholesterol is above 190 or the LDL cholesterol, you need treatment. 
If your bad cholesterol is between 70 and 189, and your risk is a certain level, we would recommend treatment with the cholesterol medication. Okay, statins are the cholesterol medication we like to use because it, you know, overall studies have suggested about a 30 to 40 percent decrease in your heart and stroke risk as far as that goes. So that would be the first line of treatment. So knowing your risk and knowing your cholesterol will help you with that. Triglycerides, this is very sensitive to lifestyle. So normally we only treat when it's above 500, although you know, there may be some data in ACC coming up in the next week which might change what we do with it. But generally, above 500 is where we treat it to avoid pancreatitis. But above 150 is considered elevated and deleterious to your you know, uh, cardiac health. Diabetes, avoid it if possible. But if you do have it, try to get your blood sugar control and also use you know, the cholesterol medication because the risk is higher. Um, other than that, we talked about the calcium score and the IMT itself. So we uh, wrote an article in the Methodist uh, um, Journal where they dedicate an entire journal issue to women. And it's a very nice issue which goes over all these details. And we wrote an article on prevention of it. You know, I encourage you to look at the entire issue. It's a very nicely done issue as far as that goes. So in summary, Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause. Women have certain unique risk factors that are not there in men. Remember, knowledge is power. Knowledge, you have to know what your risk is, and this is a lifelong process, so you have to think about prevention for long-term prevention, just not your short-term prevention. With that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.